Hello AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here with a very short video, I promise that, I halfway promise that, over topic 2.7. Uh, we're going to look at example 3, which means we're moving into the idea of taking the derivative of the natural log of x, and that's really the last transcendental function that we're going to see in this topic whose derivative that we're responsible for knowing. To recap, you've already hopefully learned the derivatives of sine of x, cosine of x, e to the x, and now natural log of x. And you're going to hear this word from time to time all throughout calculus, transcendental functions. Transcendental are just the ugly things like the trig words, the logarithms, and the e to the x's of the world. So let's take a look. So in your notes on the page where it begins at the top with differentiating ln of x, we don't mess around, guys. We jump right into the formula. And as you can see, it's the natural log of x derivative is 1 divided by x. We have to know that. We have to memorize that. Now, I'd like to give you a little bit of insight into why this derivative looks the way that it does. And again, I'm going to rely on our TI Inspire and a short little activity to make that happen. So let's take a look. So here we are. We have this activity that's entitled the derivative of logs, which will be either has been made available to you or very soon will be made available to you if you're a student of mine. But if you're not a student of mine or don't have this particular uh, activity on your calculator, I think you can kind of watch through this and we can get a little taste for what's happening here. So hopefully what you see is from the graph, I do have the function f of x equals natural log of x sketched. This is our traditional graph of natural log. Notice my x and y axes are, are partitioned into increments of one half units. And I have a tangent line that I am able to move around. And you can see that this tangent line has already been set up so that its slope is actually being calculated as I move throughout the particular document. So that makes it pretty nice and handy for us. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to position this tangent line at a value kind of commensurate with our partitioned values here. So this 0.5 would be a very good place to start. And I'm going to check out the slope. And it says the slope is 1.98, which is probably pretty close to 2. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 0.1 and I'm going to move this to where it's about that same slope. And I probably can't get it to be exactly 1.98, but I'll try to get it pretty close. All right, we'll go 1.99. So we got our first point. So how about we move on to the second point? So I'm going to click on that. I see a point appears here. And then I'm going to move this, hopefully, so that it lines up there. I see that the slope is 1. Now I'm probably going to have to move this guy out of the way here just a little bit. And I'm going to take this guy up to a value of 1 so that it kind of matches the slope of that line. And so I can move to my third point, which shows up here on the x-axis. Let's slide this so that it's vertically in alignment with that point. The slope of the green line is 0.67. Oh, I bet that's 2 thirds, or probably pretty close to 2 thirds. So there's a half. Maybe that's 2 thirds of the way up to this value of 1. Move on to the fourth point. Move the graph once again. I know you're having fun watching this. <laughs> the slope is 0.5. Ooh, that looks like an easy one. We're going to place that right about there. We go to our fifth point. Keep doing the same thing. Move this guy. Slope is about 0.4. Maybe that will work. Let's grab our next point. Move the slope. Move the tangent line right about there. One third probably is about in that spot. Move this guy up. A little bit more get our next point need to move him about where 0.29 would be that might be interesting to find 0.29 um, you know what 0.29 is right about here uh, will you guys give me a mulligan on this one remember this was 0.3 repeating I don't think I did a good job with that 0.3 repeating so I need to go back to that point and see if it'll let me uh, switch it out to 0.3 repeating I should have done that in the first place, you guys. Okay, now I feel better. Now let's get to the next point. Point 0.29, that matches. Let's go ahead and bring up the next point. Slide this over. 
I should have a y value of about 0.25. This should be about halfway, right about there. Maybe I get my picture out of the way. That would help. And I tell you what, let's do one more because I think you guys are starting to see what's happening. 0.22 would be right about maybe there, pretty close. I know we're kind of losing the, the right side of the picture. But the point is, once again, move my ugly face out of the way. If we were to take a look at these open circle dots, what graph do we feel those would sketch? Something to certainly think about. Uh, maybe we can manipulate that. Can I open up the y equal menu? I'm going to give it a try. How about I give it a shot? Let's graph 1 over x. How close were we? Pretty darn close. Okay, I missed here a little bit. I probably didn't pay close attention to that. But hopefully you can see a nice visual demonstration that the derivative of the natural log of x does indeed produce the graph of 1 over x. Let's go ahead and return to the document and take a look at a couple of examples. So here we are with our first example in this group of problems, example three. And we only have one part to this because I thought that I could really emphasize what I'm trying to emphasize with one example. And you'll notice that I've kind of threw in a few other things from a review standpoint. So we have three times the natural log of x minus two e to the x minus one half cosine of x. So it's gonna uh, address three of our four formulas. So y prime is equal to, well, you see that three, you can just plop it straight down because it is a constant after all. The derivative of the natural log of x is one over x. That's our new thing that we just learned. Drop down our minus and our two, the derivative of e to the x, of course, is e to the x. And the only thing that we have left to do is drop down this one half, take the derivative of cosine, that's going to be a little bit tricky, we get negative sine of x, right? And then we have our correct answer. Now, of course, we could clean this up if we wanted to. We could write this as 3 over x. Can't do much to the 2e to the x, so I'll leave it as that. And then a double negative can, of course, be a positive there. And that would suffice as our derivative in probably the best, most simplified form. So when you're working with the derivative of ln of x, it's going to be pretty simple right now. But as we progress through some more intricate derivative rules later on, we can sort of beef up the difficulty a little bit. But you're going to be more than prepared for it. Now I want to end with this other side note about talking um, a little bit about another kind of logarithm, and that would be the log of any base b. In calculus, and really a lot of high-level math and science, the logarithm that we're most concerned with is the natural log. And it's not an accident that that's the case, because the natural log is named that way because it really has a lot of applications to the world, to the natural world, to nature. And so it's a very common type of logarithm that we encounter. But I know that we can take logarithms of many other bases. Perhaps you use the log of base 10 quite a bit in a previous math course. Well, I wanted to let you know that you can take the derivative of a logarithm no matter what the base is. It's not going to be on your AP Calc exam. You're only going to see the derivative of the natural log. But it is a part of calculus in general. Perhaps a college calc course might address it a little bit. So let's talk just a little bit about the derivative of the log base b of x. Well, I have a formula for you. And right here it is. The derivative of the log of any base b of x is just 1 divided by the natural log of b times x in that denominator. And if you notice, there's a very familiar part of this, this 1 over x which was the derivative of the natural log, is a part of this formula. It's just that we have this natural log of b hanging around, and we might wonder, why is that? So what we're going to do is maybe investigate this a little bit. And I make a statement here. I hate to just generalize calculus as to be a formula and say, here it is, use it, memorize it. It's not a very difficult connection to make. I want you to recall a change of base formula. You may have learned it in a college algebra class. Maybe it was your pre-calculus class. It says that the log base b of x is equal to the natural log of x over the natural log of b. Basically, it's a way to take a logarithm of any base and write it as a natural log quotient. 
Why is that important? Well, take a look at almost any scientific calculator and I bet you see a natural log button on that calculator. But I bet you don't see a log with base four button on that particular calculator. At least it's usually very rare for most scientific calculators. So what we can do with this is think about if we were taking the log base 4 of 7. And what I've done here is I've taken a couple of screenshots from a TI Inspire. And if you take the log base 4, uh, base four of 7, you get 1.40368. Now a lot of you might be watching this and maybe you've forgotten a little bit about logarithms. You're like, what does that even mean? All a logarithm is is an exponent. So you're just saying, what power would you raise 4 to to get 7? I bet that's a pretty ugly number. I bet it's a number that's larger than 1, but probably smaller than 2, because 4 squared is 16. And lo and behold, it is a number that lies between 1 and 2. 1.4, approximately. Well, I wanted you to see that if we wrote this as the natural log of the x, which in this case would be the 7, see how the x plays the role of the 7, and put that on top, and the natural log of b, the b plays the role as the 4, <clears throat> and we put that on bottom, if we type that into a calculator, we get the exact same result. So this change of base formula is very reliable, but why is it important? Well, if taking the derivative of the log base b of x is a little tricky for us, how about we take the derivative of the natural log of x over the natural log of b with respect to x? Now, I know that looks a lot more complicated, but if I were to tell you that b is a constant, would you agree that the natural log of b is a constant as well? So you can just drop that constant out in front of your derivative. And so the only thing really to take the derivative of is the natural log of x, which guess what? Is 1 over x. And I think you can see a pretty tight connection between our results. All right? Like I said, a lot of high school calculus classes, AP calculus classes, may never even talk about this, and it's perfectly okay. But I wanted to just to spend a few minutes showing you that it is a thing. It might be a part of a college calc course, even though it's not on the AP exam. And so we've at least been exposed to it. We can learn a little bit more about this wonderful world of derivatives that, that do exist. All right. Thanks for sticking around. We'll see you at the next video.